There is our beloved tiny robot telling us that recording is in progress. Um, for those who have were not on the recording, you missed some great jokes at the top of the, the hour, and we'll we'll dive in now. So to start off with a welcome everyone to our second Truth and Labeling Task Force meeting. A uh, little housekeeping uh, after now that we are starting to record, because I, I really wanted to do a, a thanks to Alex in particular, as well as DQ staff, David and Abby, for their support and leadership on this. It's in, in, incredibly helpful and impactful, and lets us do this job together, uh, serve uh, Oregon's residents uh, to be able to do this task force. So just wanted to, to pause and, and thank every thank them for the, their amazing logistical assistance, which uh, would, th these meetings would not happen without them. So thank you so much to the DEQ. Um, also, while well, in the spirit of gratitude, wanted to thank uh, Vice Chair Anya, uh, Brandon, Anya, thank you so very much. Really appreciate you taking all the time to connect and support behind the scenes. And then of course, all of the task force members for your efforts and making the time available on extremely crowded calendars. We're all living the same life right now. Uh, via Zoom, back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. And I know how hard it is to, to make time on incredibly crowded calendars and appreciate your uh, prioritizing this and, and answering doodle polls quickly and all of that jazz. So, so thank you all very much. Uh, really hopeful to have some good impactful work here. And, and again, couldn't do it without you prioritizing it. So thank you so very much. Uh, also wanted to share that we have a resources page for everyone who is listening in. So that is a uh, posted agendas, resources, recordings of previous meetings um, that are, uh, oh, and Alex has already, he beat me to it. He popped it in the chat bot. See, again, he's, he's, he's on top of things. Um, so again, if you're looking for what happened at the last meeting or after this meeting, what happens at this meeting, please just go there. And then lastly, uh, per our amended rules, we will allow some time uh, for public comment at 2.45 at the end of today's meeting. So please add your name to the list via the comment uh, function of the meeting, and we'll call on you in the order that your requests are made. So, um, so again, please, please chime in, and we look forward to hearing questions and commentary for, uh, for, for, from the public. Okay, so I thought I would start, and this is something I, I, um, uh, I hopefully you won't get tired of me saying, but I, I, I wanted to, uh, at, at times at the beginning of the meeting, but also during the meetings to just refresh our memory of what our charge is, you know, of, of what, what in statute is outlined for what we are to do. And I'm just going to read it verbatim, which is that the, the task force shall study and evaluate misleading or confusing claims regarding the recyclability of products made on product or product packaging. The study must include consideration of issues affecting accessibility for diverse audiences, and that we, uh, the task force shall submit a final report and recommendations for legislation no later than June 1st, 2022. And I'm sure as all of you on today, Palindrome Tuesday, you realize how close that is because man, it sure does feel like February started yesterday and it's uh, over next week. So um, with that, I thought we could dive in. And um, our, our first activity is uh, one that I thought would, uh, I think kind of be helpful uh, to help personalize this work, which I thought we could share uh, with each other a confusing label. And so this is for the task force. And so I thought that you could all share in, in order, uh, you know, you can unmute yourself and, and comment uh, to say each task force member to give an example of a confusing label that you've encountered as a consumer. We're all consumers here. And so I thought I'd start um, working in the recycling business. Everybody knows I do. Uh, and so I get text messages of recycling questions, you know, back when there used to be picnics, people would ask me questions. And, and I recently got one of, um, uh, from, from the, a meals box, you know, those like cold chain custody things where people have the, the, the it's like pre-prepped food that you then cook up at home. And they have a, a lining an insulation lining that is foamed to PET. So that's PET, like in your soda bottles and water bottles, but it's foamed and it gives instructions to, to roll it up and to put it in your recycling bin. And I thought that was uh, that was a really salient example of something because I'm unaware of MRFs being able to process that nor reclaimers. 
to be able to process it. And there are some pretty gaudy claims put on that type of box. And I thought that was a really interesting one. And so that was sent to me. And I thought that would be a, a good example for the group. Um, maybe you can raise your hands, those on the task force, if you like, and we can call on you to let you know, like see, see if you have a, a misleading claim or something that you've seen. Thomas, I see your hand up. Yeah, thanks, Dylan. Uh, I've seen one that's interesting. It's a toothbrush and it's 100% recycled handle and package, and it's a sustainable eco premium toothbrush. And on the back, it says the handle's made with 100% recycled PET, and then please recycle it after use. So I'm also not aware of Murph's wanting toothbrushes or recyclers wanting toothbrushes. Dave's got his hand up next, so maybe he's going to tell us about a time oh. that's happened. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> Dave, go ahead. Sure, sorry, I'm out of breath. I didn't realize we were doing it this way. I took, I had photos but I ran oh. and got the things. Um, so this is a uh, bottle of instant creamer we acquired for a camping trip. And it's a number two bottle and it's got the, uh, the plastic sleeve on it that um, some packages ask you to remove for recycling. But instead, and I don't know if you can see it here, it's got a how to recycle label. It says on it, plastic bottle, and a recycling symbol with a line through it. It's like, but it's a it's a plastic bottle. It's there's an, it, there's nothing on it to say. So it's just a case of somebody somewhere in the pipeline getting getting the how to recycle label wrong for that product. Um, well, do, other, does it say to not recycle it? It has got a line through it. So that that would well, be that's that's the in, in, international symbol for don't do things. Yeah, I was going to say, well, then maybe that's accurate because it, it didn't get a label, a positive label because it's got a shrink sleeve. I don't know. I'm, I'm sure. just throwing it out there. That's and, interesting. Yeah, this is the uh, this is the alternative to that, where this is another bottle, um, not to brand hype, but um, this has a two part how to recycle label. And it says that the bottle is recyclable and that the label is not recyclable and with a little note that says that the bottle's not recyclable if you leave the label on. Um, and my third example- Oh, Dave, he is, came prepped. Uh, I only have, only have three loaded that I can hold up. Um, but the bottom of, I've, I have toys in my office and this is the toy that's not important right now. But on the <laughs> bottom, um, you can probably see oh, yeah. here there's the there's the uh the the tri man for yeah. france there's the uh green dot label and then there's a how to recycle covering each one of the components other than the toy itself of how this can be broken down um so that's a lot of information to be on the bottom of a toy box but what i think people will take from it is look at all those recycling symbols this must be fine to go in the recycling. Uh, so, wow, uh, super, super, super. Those are great, man. That's a compliant. That's compliant soup right there, Dave. That's a good one. Um, okay, Jenny, you you raised your hands. You're up next. Okay, I hope. Let me see if I can like. I we got. I I don't use tubes of toothpaste. I get the um, tablets in a glass jar, but. My boyfriend's not on the same page. So this is Tom's and it says the recycling revolution starts here. And all of the artwork on the tube of toothpaste says this tube is recyclable, doing good every day. And then on the back, it set it has the recycling symbol. Once empty, replace cap and recycle with number two plastics. And even I was very, I'm like, replace cap, what, what does that mean? And then who still sorts by number two plastics anymore? And isn't it already contaminated with toothpaste on the inside? And who wants this flexible tube? So I don't know. It's quite the marketing thing, though, because there's you walk past this in the store and you feel like you're doing something really good, getting this recyclable toothpaste tube that, as far as I know, nobody wants. So that was mine it was just so in your face. <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. That's a, a, a good example. It's interesting. I, well, gosh, I feel like each of these we could have a, a whole conversation about. Kristen, what about you? Uh, just briefly, because you stole part of mine, Dylan, was the food box one. But mm. I don't know if yours said it, but the one that I saw uh, said very clearly, 
certified curbside recycling. So oh. you know it had been certified somewhere that it could go in your curbside recycling. And then of course the other um, fan favorite at the Aura office is the plastic dog chew toy with the oh, yeah. chasing arrows and the number seven on it. But I sent all mine via email because I wasn't sure if we were doing them in pictures or live. So I'll just leave it at that. But yeah, there's lots of, so many examples, so little time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. No, that's great. Any any other any other uh, folks that want to share a confusing recycling label that's been sent to you, or that you you've encountered on a store shelf? All right. Well, I thought that would be fun, and it was. I hope it's uh, you know I, I I guess it sets a little bit of the stage as to the work that we're looking to do here, you know, uh, and and also just the impact that it has on ourselves is that, you know, clear and consistent communication is something that's that's key to, to make sure that we aren't confused and we as uh, varying levels of, of uh, recycling expertise, you know, get confused and then obviously the general public can be confused as well. So, um, so with that, uh, that was a, a, a fun little exercise. We wanted to do another exercise and a discussion around claims. Um, and so right now, uh, we're going to walk through some uh, uh, products and labels and task force members, please uh, pull up the link that Alex sent out this morning so we can do a quick poll. Uh, task force members only, please. And uh, I, I actually did not do my own. So give me one moment. I need to pull up my, my thing as well. And if anyone... Sorry, Dylan, if anyone can't find their link, just shoot me a message uh, privately and I can send that to you for task force members. Thank you, Alex. I'm, I'm putting my name in now. All right. Okay, so should this get a recycling label? If anybody is not, there we go, we get this live. Good. And then Alex, I'm, because you know when everybody has logged in, I'll, I'll wait for you to kind of switch slides because you have that ability. Just a minute. Uh, I think that's uh, that's probably good. We can move I think along. That looks good. Okay. No, sixty-seven percent. And and keep in mind that the labels that are then shown in photos don't necessarily mean that that they it should or shouldn't. We're just we're just using we're using these as examples. So, uh, but this is clear that it is communicated. You know, the, the question is where where that would be recyclable is 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 a question. Okay, why don't we do the next one? So this is a, a chicken uh, that um, has a plastic wrap and then a, a plastic shell for the chicken to sit in. So don't vote yet. Let me uh, go to this next one and clear it. And then now y'all can vote. I'm sorry, for some reason I'm getting a thing to register. Yeah, you have to type in your name, Sean. So okay. So <laughs> type, in, type in your name and then you'll be taken to the poll. And this this is not data that's going to be Sorry. used. It's it's totally okay. This is really just meant to be an exercise to sort of yeah. look look at you know what the challenges are that we're facing. Uh, it's not working for me for some reason. I I apologize. Well, I think Donna, you can just vote out loud. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Say no. I'm gonna no. keep trying here. All right, Dylan, do you want to move along to the yeah. discussion on whether or not folks, uh, they have any discussion on the, the item? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, if, if we want to, look, absolutely. So please chime in. So this says recyclable tray on the, the chicken thighs there. So again, would, would love to dig in. The last one, obviously, you, you know, the cardboard, if separated, is recyclable. Uh, the plastic, you know, uh, here currently would not be. Um, this this is a, a big one. I'd love for folks to unmute themselves and chime in about your your take on on uh, the natural chicken thighs, air chilled chicken thighs. Let 
we need to raise hands or just uh, start just talking? unmute the truth and labeling task force members only go ahead will okay um well a couple things here um technically probably the uh tray may be recyclable if it's clean and dry or clean i don't know how you get raw chicken off without you know making sure of a few things. Uh, most people, if you've ever been to a Merck, don't rinse anything. Um, and so I would say no to that, even if it was recyclable, because people just don't um, do what they're supposed to do most of the time. Um, so, uh, and until we have some sort of a program where these are acceptable uh, and there's a market for that type of plastic, then I would say no. Thank you, Will. All right, let's go to the next one, Alex. All right, again, uh, bear with me, don't vote until uh, I give you the okay, but this item is a water filter out of a refrigerator uh, to filter that water there. So it's a plastic cell with a inner media to filter water. So let me clear the poll and go for it. And as you can see, it does have a recyclable label on it. And and again, you know, depending on what that intermedia is, obviously that that can provide some real challenges for a reclaimer. So that's that's helpful. Okay, let's do let's do another one. All right, so uh, a rechargeable battery. And, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, let us know when we should. Okay, yeah, bear vote. with me again while I clear these. Sorry, you might have to vote again. Did that have a recycling label on it, Alex? Well, we well, find I out after we yeah. vote. Oh, oh, the big reveal. Sorry. Yeah. So we get we get the all right. So eighteen percent said yes. So you know that's uh, an interesting one. So these yeah. oh go yeah, ahead. Go ahead. No, please go ahead. Oh, so uh, these were the the labels that were on this uh, re uh, rechargeable battery. So there's two that say don't throw it away. There's a recycling label, and uh, then there's the caution label. And what is the NIMH under the recycling label? It's the type of, of battery it is. So it's a ah, nickel, nickel. Nickel metal hydride. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you. Correct. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Dave is doing a nickel metal hydride dance for the record. Thank you. And just curious, what's the exclamation point in the... Um, Danger. Caution, yeah. That's the <laughs> international caution sign. So, so is there some point where it blows up if you smash it too, or do we? It could. Simple too. Oh, okay. You could drag it with the loader accidentally if it's in a cart, and it would set my Murph on fire again. Sounds like a previous experience there, Will. You probably Absolutely. Don't want to yeah. 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 And I don't. I don't believe nickel or as flammable as lithium ion, but that doesn't matter, right? Yeah, they're, I don't trust right. anybody. To, they can't Fair figure enough. out the right plastics. I don't figure. I don't think they can figure out the right battery. To, you know. So my my thought on this, sorry, real quick, is it shouldn't have the recycling on it. Batteries are they recyclable? Yes, but that symbol seems to mean to people throw it in the cart. That's why I. My thinking is nothing should have the recycling label on it unless it's on the list of things that go in the curbside cart, which is why I'm saying no to all of these until something comes up that's obvious. That's just my opinion on it. Um, it's in that um, paper that we hopefully we all read um, that says, please restrict. It didn't say please restrict the chasing arrows to stuff that is actually recyclable. This should say something like hazardous please call your local authority something. But, you know, it's not supposed to go in the trash and it's also not supposed to go in the cart, the recycling cart. 
Thank you for that, Will. Appreciate it. Uh, that, that is that is that is a, a an outcome that could come from this. We're, we're obviously not predetermined here, although certainly appreciate your perspective. Uh, so let's move on to the next the next one. Quick question. Um, this I know this is nothing's cut and dry and clean. Will is it? Doesn't Marion County have a battery recycling program that you can put them in a plastic bag on top of the cart or in the glass bin? That's correct. Yeah. So that makes it even more confusing, I guess, right? Yes, that's <laughs> right. They just need to put it in the right spot. In the right spot. Mm -hmm. And we're one of a few places that do that, I think. So when you're talking countrywide. Yeah, there's a fair amount of it in California, I believe. Right. And Dylan, that was the last vote. So we are now in uh, more of a, a discussion phase. Um, so this box here is uh, a beverage box that you can find liquids inside of at your local grocery store. It has a uh, Mylar type pouch inside and we see on the box, the original environmentally friendly box. Is this shelf stable for things like uh, dairy products or uh, it's a wine, wine box. Oh, okay. Well, the much yeah. better choice really to talk about. That we're only a little bit later on a Tuesday. We can <laughs> yeah, exactly. It. Okay. So, I mean, it is technically a box that's recyclable, but the problem is the how do you remind people to pull that bladder out? And right. pull your bladder out is not the kind of thing that a wine uh, <laughs> folks are going to want on the back of their box uh, but I, I guess the, the, but this here is not a direction it's a claim right it's a it's just a purely a marketing claim it's not suggesting that it is that you are to recycle the box it's just it's just using the symbol for its emotional connection it doesn't have Which a direction of course, it does suggest to people that they should recycle it because they see that on there and think oh yeah i can recycle this it's got the label on it look at that there's right. the arrows is it is it cardboard or yeah is it just a cardboard box? I, think I believe it, so. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, uh, I have some personal experience with wine boxes. Um, I do take the uh, obviously I take the pouch out. Um, I think this would be a prime example of one of those labels that says box, chasing arrows, bladder, or whatever else you want to call it, so you don't offend you know certain people. Uh, bladder, throw away. You know, maybe this is an, a perfect example of it. Agreed. Yeah, that's something. Obviously, we we don't want that pouch left in there, and that that is that is a, a preferred outcome is that clear communication, and I think that's what we'll we'll definitely be getting into that. Alex, can we see another another example? Oh yeah. So this one is a very interesting one. This is a sharps container. Uh, it uh, you put your sharps inside of it, and then at the bottom it has the chasing arrows and says a hundred percent. And, and this is one that I have stared at when I've been at a doctor's office and wondered wondered what it meant, you know, whether it's that they recover everything that's a part of the, the sharps that are in there, is the container made out of recycled content? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of a lot of questions. Would would love folks' comments on this. I think the the that label is about recycled content. Um, I think there are but at, once again, you'd have to be a label expert to know the difference between recycled content and recyclable based on the chasing arrows, because trust me, you're not recycling the stuff that's inside there. Oh no, you're disposing of it. I totally agree, but I'm, I'm still wondering where that came, that came from. That, uh, yeah, yeah I agree. Confusing. Very, very confusing and misleading. Um, we have found entire boxes of those on our line. We've found them without the boxes and we've had luckily only one or two incidences of, of my employees getting poked with dirty needles so yes we don't want them in there but so i just this last week we had a conversation about these because we get them um obviously and we have sharp containers around our offices um for, for a number of reasons um and a new person said oh just as long as they're in the box you can just throw them away you just throw the box away and he's from out of state and i said uh, no, actually, it's illegal to throw them away, even if they're protected in the box. So now you can't recycle it, can't throw it away again, just like the battery. So they need to know where to take it. And that's, you know, again, check your local authorities and where to take it. So that green chasing arrows thing should be nowhere on this. Thank you for that, Will. 
would love other thoughts or comments from folks on, on any of the preceding ones. Happy, happy to hear. Just love, would love folks' commentary. I agree. The, the confusion between what is recycled content and what is recyclable using that same symbol is uh, going to be a tricky, a tricky recurring issue for us, I believe. Um, and thinking about, you know, we all might think RCS and know exactly what that is, but that's not exactly, you know, consumer friendly either if we're talking about recycled content. Um, and so thinking through how to make sure we are uh, Walking that fine line is not going to be easy. <laughs> I'd really love to hear from those who haven't chimed in too. So if you want to have Alex go back in the, the slides too, you know, I'm sure I, he can go backwards or forwards. He's very good at these PowerPoint presentations. So would, would, love, would love to hear from folks we haven't heard from already. Mm -hmm. I'll chime in for a second. Um, my thought when I saw the Sharps container was definitely that it was a it must be a PCR statement, but that's only because I have background in this. So if, if I were just someone in a bathroom, I would have no idea what it was talking about and think it was odd that, you know, the, the sharps were somehow being recycled. Also, um, Alex, if you could go back to the wine box, which I also have a fair amount of experience with. Um, I, it also just sort of bothers me that, that it's the recycling center with symbol with environmentally friendly because there's so much that comes along with that kind of a statement. Um, and it seems like they use so much space for that anyway, that it would have been really easy for them to just actually provide information about what to do. Like, what's the point of this? It's truly just for marketing. It's not to help anyone understand action. Um, so these, these annoy me. Um, and that one in particular, I think um, it, it does have like a feel good look to it. So for people to misconstrue the, the purpose. Thank you, Athena. Dan, it sounded like you were going to try that. Well, yeah, I was going to, I think it's, I don't disagree with you completely, but I think it's complicated as well because it looks to me like Beverage Box is the, this is their brand name. So they're making it more confusing. I mean, if I just looked down at its face value and said an environmentally friendly box and took that to mean that box is, <laughs> you know, recyclable and made a paper comment. I get that, but then it's added confusion because that appears to be their brand name as well. So to your point, it's maybe a bit misleading. <laughs> so, and then I, I did want to, uh, you don't have to go back to it, but the Sharps container, personally, I, it never even would have occurred to me. And trust me, I'm dealing with a, recycle, a lot of recycled content proposals now is that this had anything to do with recycled content. So I appreciate others looking at it through that lens because it wouldn't have occurred to me this was saying anything about recycled content. Um, but I can see why others might think that. So interesting. Yeah, Bonus. and isn't, isn't that the international um, hazardous waste symbol on there as well? I mean, it's... It's what we got to do. It's all about education. So thank you for your comments. Keep Commissioner Kramer. For those who haven't chimed in, would you like to, to join us? Sean, Lee? No. One thing I would add on that, um, the beverage box, wine box example is um, kind of the what onus do we get can we put on the consumer? You know, this seems relatively easy to separate. Um, I think at some point there was a, a, a cereal box, the bag inside example, you know, those are pretty easy to separate. Um, and then going back to one of our first pictures from the day um, that, you know, paperback with plastic on it, like, is that glue? Is that tape? Like, how can we, can we trust that that is an easy system for consumers to break apart? Um, and how do we think about how to label those products given, you know, the potential contamination for consumers doing that wrong. Well, and, and, and also, you know, whether it's, a, and I think about this too, because we'll, we'll be talking to folks from California as well as DEQ will be talking about how recyclability determinations are made. And this, this is actually connected to the tube. I'm sure you saw in the, the chat that the, the tube, you know, is unlike other tubes, it's all made from one material and uh, has been tested for recyclability, has gone through some recyclability testing and, and thus why that claim is made on that, uh, on, on that tube. 
Um, but it's a question of whether or not it has the recyclability determination in the states that we're talking about today, which is going to be Oregon and California. And if it does, then then again, communicating clearly and consistently, I think, is going to be key. It's, it's a really interesting question to be able to, to dig in on. Thank you for that, Anya. Dave, yeah, you're, I see your hand raised. Yeah, uh, and I understand uh, the the idea behind the, the claim for the toothpaste tube. It's similar to uh, some things we've seen that are made out of recycled uh, PET, uh, whether it's a uh, packing foam or uh, clothing, and they have recycling symbols all over the label, letting you know that it's made from recycled bottles, but it also gives people the idea that they can uh, recycle it. In some cases, it straight up says that they can, but where the, I guess where the rubber meets the road is uh, on Will's sort line, uh, just as an example, if if they have staff watching the plastic bottles go by, pulling out things that don't belong, a toothpaste tube is going to get pulled out every time. It's something that's not a plastic bottle. So it, it was almost a waste of effort for them to make it out of something that could, th te could theoretically get processed with the plastic bottles if the people in charge of quality control don't know that, it's, um, that, it, that it is uh, one if, because if you show them six other toothpaste tubes every time, they're going to say toothpaste tubes aren't plastic bottles. They don't belong here. So I just, uh, that's, that's my concern. And, and, and the, what unfortunately leads to from a consumer perspective is people are willing to pay more. Uh, it's like, oh, that recyclable toothpaste, uh, that's, that's something I care about. So it's worth an extra 50 cents. Uh, and um, it's not going to be recycled. So uh, at least not, not in a regular curbside program. If you saved them all up yourself for 20 years and then mailed them into the factory, maybe then, but um, there's just so much uh, wrong with that. I don't know. I guess I'm glad we're meeting to talk about how we might address some of those things. And I do think that that determination of recyclability, you know, again, and I, I, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, the Recycling Partnership is working on, you know, recyclability determinations through our pathway to circularity work. And we've, I'll share a link to the, the, the task force to show what, what that work is and the various stakeholders that it, it is engaging with for that. But again, that, that is the question. If you are doing a determination, how is it determined? And then how are you going to communicate that, I think is really key. Uh, Will, you add your hand up. And then Thomas. Yeah, just to follow up, uh, follow on. Um, the tube of toothpaste is not, there's two reasons, two other reasons beside the obvious uh, that it's not a bottle. Um, it's small. Um, and so we'll fall through um, all the screens, but the smallest. Um, and yes, if we had the time to pull out toothpaste tubes, uh, in addition to the 20% of everything else that's there, um, you know, it's not only Tom's that's going to go through, there's going to be, you know, there are, we do find toothpaste tubes periodically just because I don't know why. Um, so, okay, everybody, we're going to concentrate on toothpaste tubes, only pull out Tom's. Well, if you've ever been to a MRF, there's a foot of material sometimes coming through and you can't, you're not going to be able to see anything. I, I understand the wishful recycling. But that tube is going to fall through with the with the shredded paper hint, um, not to be put in the bin, and uh, be thrown away anyway. Um, so uh, I think that's it. Thank you, Will. Thomas, you have your hand up. Yeah, just observation. Looking at the labels and products we've just gone through and had conversations about, it's clear to me. I think that most of it is, or a large portion of it, is marketing driven. So it's driven to send a message to the consumer that they're to. A responsible product manufacturer and the product is a responsible choice so that someone chooses their product uh, without any consequence downstream for what happens to that material at the end of the day. So that's, I think, the, the, the heart of the EPR work and thinking about those downstream, uh, you know, consequences of those labels need to be shared and not just shouldered by the consumer and the uh, disposal system at the end of the day. And, and, and I think that's going to be an interesting conversation today, because one of the things here in Oregon with the passage of 582 
is is that we are setting up a system that allows for that burden to be shared you know and and for that you know for the the leveling up of that system to be paid for by those who are putting the materials onto the market jenny you had your hand raised yeah just a really quick comment oh let me put my hand down um i just saw in the in the chat that somebody mentioned that in rhode island they recycle toothpaste tubes and it does bring up a really good point you know with people moving from so many different places to Oregon and not having consistent recycling policies, even within Oregon right now, but thankfully that will change. Um, you know, having just deciding what we, deciding on these really clear labels is so, it just makes it more clear how important it is because people get used to what they do in their community. And then you go to a different community and having the rules always change, no matter how much education or if you work for a municipality and you send out new residents a little flyer or whatever um, and they don't read it whatever is on that whatever Oregon decides we have to make it so clear that this applies to Oregon right you know that these are the rules here that whatever you are bringing with you from Rhode Island or California like this is what you have to learn to do in this state and that these labels apply very clearly to this state and when we talk about California, I just want to like keep that in mind too, that that migration between states is something that really makes it difficult for people. Well, well the hopes, the hopes is, well, we'll get to that, uh, not to spoiler alert, but we'll, we'll have a good robust update as to how those lists will be populated by those states. And then I, I, the second part of following that, we'll have a conversation that'll be directed around that very question that you raised, Jenny. So that's super helpful. Um, and Will, uh, you want to see how it's sorted online? I will be able to share that information, uh, the, the the MRF sortation protocol that that the the tube passed. Again, I'll I'll pass that on to the Truth and Labeling Task Force. I'll capture that uh, as a group. Are there other comments or questions about this piece? Uh, before we before we move on to that determination of recyclability of how we how we populate recycled recycled materials lists. Oh, we have more labels. We I have we were done more. with labels. Thank you, Alex. Let's we keep have going. A few more. So the, this is a how to recycle label. Uh, it says recycle if clean and dry and store drop off plastic bags, film and wrap. That was, that was my piece to the beginning puzzle was that <laughs> this this is our number one contaminant, but yet it's told to recycle. So anyway, there we go. Um, I was going to say, I think it seems like the the label itself is explicit. It's it's telling us what to do. Whether people actually read it and take the right action, I think is a separate conversation. And I wonder a little bit about whether the, the Mobius arrows are just not the right tool for this kind of a label, if, you know. Yeah, I, I agree. I like that it's explicit and it tells us what to do. And I have the same fear because um, I've put up so many signs in our recycle center and we still get you know, couches and wood and, and plate glass and everything else. So I know from experience that people don't read and the people that do read are the people that we already know, in my opinion, that already feel the way we do. Um, and most people aren't gonna read it. I, I hesitate, yes, back to um, Sean questioning, um, you know, is that recyclable, a battery is recyclable? Yes. Is plastic film recyclable? Yes. Um, but it doesn't go in the bin. So I, there's, that's my, one of my issues. How do, we, how do we make people aware that it's recyclable, but in a different way than the cart? That's the crux of the issue, I think. Thank you, Will. Jenny, you had your hand raised, and then Kristen. Yeah, I think that this also just brings up the questions around labeling with English language literacy. So if, you're, if you can't read recycle of clean and dry store drop off, um, but you see the chasing arrows, 
and you still want to do the right thing, then the chasing arrows would imply that you should put it into your recycling bin. And so I like I agree with Athena that the arrows is probably the confusing part of this label, <laughs> um, assuming that you do have English language literacy. Um, taking the arrows off, I feel like would be maybe the first step and then literacy is a whole separate question for us to tackle, but. <laughs> yeah, which I think we'll have to get to because that is that is the second sentence in our charge, which is the study must include consideration of issues affecting accessibility for diverse right. audiences. So that's that okay. great, great raise there, Jenny. Kristen, you had your hand raised. Oh. Yeah, I, I think Jenny. Oh, and then Dave, that. you're next. Oh. No, sorry, go Kristen. I was just telling Dave he was next. Okay. No, I think Jenny raised a really good point on the, you know, the, the equity pieces that we need to be considering about the language. And I hadn't thought of that when I looked at this because I was actually going to say, I think this is a pretty good label for how to recycle. And I'm not usually a big fan of, of what I see um, because generally there isn't just one box, there's five or six on a, on a package. Those were some of my other examples I would have brought out here as well. Uh, but I, I think this does a pretty good job of telling you what to do. And I am a little more um, optimistic than Will about people reading this, particularly with all the outreach campaigns we intend to do through 582 to do more education, to make sure people are paying attention and to provide feedback that includes some level of, you know, you're going to do a good job or not. And we're going to let you know about that. So I think, you know, if, if, 22 to 65% of people say they're looking before they put it in a cart, that this will help them make the decision not to put it in our cart. So. Yeah, that's that. And, and, and I, I just want to offer a friendly amendment, not intends that we will do. That's part of 582 is that there will be that anti-contamination programming offered by, you know, from that menu of options. So that's that that is, I think, a, a helpful context as we're thinking about that. It's not the recycling system today, but it's that recycling system, the future that this is going to be interacting with. And, and again, that we, we have this this act that has passed that is going to kind of set that context. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. No, no worries. I forgot we were raising hands. <laughs> it's it's certainly the best best way to do things. But um, I was just uh, wanted to touch on what what Jenny said. It, it's it's not just folks who struggle uh, or or don't read English uh, that have a barrier. But even I mean I'm not that old. But uh, just a just a salad dressing example that I used. I struggled in decent light with my glasses on to to read the tiny words telling me uh, not to take the wrap off. So there's an accessibility issue over that. And I think when in doubt, the largest symbol, whatever's uh, whatever's biggest on the bottom of the uh, the package is, is what's going to uh, inform people's decisions. Like you said, they're making it at their kitchen, at the sink or, you know, in their, in their garage or in their yard or on the street, they're not, um, they don't have access to all the information. They have what they can see. Uh, and I think that again, on the accessibility, just this, how big is, how big is big enough? Uh, should there, is there a minimum size? Is it, uh, does it need to be scaled to the size of the container? It's like any container under a certain size doesn't need a label. I don't know the answer, but uh, just something we should, if we can try and keep in mind when we're writing uh, the recommendations uh, that the, uh, the size matters. Thank you, Dave. Alex, have, I think we have another how to recycle. There we go. Yeah, so we this, have this is another, another one for us. So we have a uh, paper sleeve and plastic tray. The plastic tray says check locally with an asterisk and remove from sleeve. The paper sleeve just has the chasing arrows above it. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Sorry, I was, oh, go ahead, Anya. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think one thing that does help with 582 is that there will be a statewide list um, and that can help clarify a lot of these things. But in general, I am, um, I don't think checking locally and providing further info um, is a great solution set since I don't think, um, you know, many of us, 
as we started this call on Zoom today, have time in our schedule to go and independently research every item um, if it needs to be separated and researched locally. Um, and I think that is uh, kind of getting to that second sentence in our charge about accessibility, um, making sure we're not putting an undue burden on our consumers in Oregon. Thank you, Anya. And, and Dave, I interrupted you. Were you trying to speak or was your hand raised from before? I'm always trying uh, to speak, <laughs> it seems. But no, it was just, uh, my hand was just still up. I'm sorry. You want to offer commentary on this on this label? No, okay. I think you've, you've made your, your point clear. Are there other comments from task force members that would like to comment on, on this particular label? Go ahead, Will. You're on mute, Will, if you're talking. I can't quite see your mouth is behind you. Dang, hand. I lowered my hand and I thought that would also. Anyway, um, I, I, it's this label is good for a brain like mine because I appreciate the info and I will seek it out. Um, but I don't know that everybody will. I'm pretty sure they won't. Um, and check locally. Um, you're right. I don't think people are going to take the time and check who does everybody know who to call who they you know they're going to maybe they'll call their hauler maybe they'll call us I don't know. So it's um, I like it and don't like it at the same time. How do we simplify it and, and 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 Dave I'm all in with make it larger I think half the package should have what to do with it when it's done it's that important. Thank, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Will. Lee, go right ahead. Senator Ryer, sorry. That's okay. Uh, you know, from someone who's not in the business and that familiar with it, like all of you are, this is sort of confusing. I think if someone, just a normal consumer, picked it up and said, what do I do with this? It would take a whole lot of thought to get to that. Maybe if they had used, if instead it was black and white, if there was some standardized colored pattern, that could be helpful. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Senator Breyer. I'm so sorry. I'm so used to calling everybody by their first name here. I apologize. That's, that's perfectly Breyer. fine. Don't worry about that. Thank you. And uh, I, I see a, a former Oregon Recycling Steering Committee member commented here, said checking locally is getting easier. Many municipalities and haulers are incorporating things like Recollects Waste Wizard features in their mobile apps and on their websites, which is that that's that that is a piece that's a bit of a difference. And I think that when we get into that research phase, we'll talk about some other potential solutions that are being looked at that, that you know, maybe that is integrated more into our thinking. That's a, a good question. Other comments about this label? Alex, I, I, do, you, do you have one more? I can't remember. That is the last one. So we can uh, continue moving forward. Terrific. All right. Well, we are, we are just, just we're doing a, we're we're doing pretty well on time. We're we're a little ahead of schedule, um, so now we are at the part of our conversation of of what we were just talking about is that determination of recyclability and how lists are going to be developed, and so uh, we will have uh, uh, California and then Oregon discuss how their lists are are integrated. And now that we are ahead of schedule, we'll actually have a little bit of time for questions from our task force members as well. Alex, do you want to do the official introduction? Yeah, I would love to. So uh, we actually have Dan Brown from California here today. And he's going to share some information with us about uh, how California is deciding what gets the recycling label and what doesn't and, and how they figured that out. So uh, if you have questions for him, definitely keep those uh, in mind. But Dan, if you're here, we'd love to see you and you can take it away. Sounds good, thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Dan Brown. I'm the manager of the knowledge integration section in the policy office at CalRecycle. And my shop um, has the majority of CalRecycle's responsibilities in terms of uh, what we've been um, authorized to do uh, pursuant to SB 343. Um, so to, to go at a high level, uh, what CalRecycle is required to do to implement 343 is to um, amend 
some of our regulations on quarterly reporting that we receive from reporting entities statewide and those being solid waste facilities, recyclers, composters, um, things of that nature. Uh, those folks will have to then add to their reporting uh, an indication for recyclable material inflows, uh, what sort of stream those materials were collected from, which would be, you know, was this coming from residential curbside, was this source separated residential cur curbside, was it mixed uh, residential curbside, uh, commercial, you know, so on and so forth. And then second, what materials are they actively recovering from the waste stream? So by design, what are they instructing their sorters uh, to pull out uh, as part of their processing? Um, we're interested in that information, not just to get an idea of what um, these recyclers are pulling out, but also to see fluctuations from quarter to quarter in terms of um, if some materials may be pulled out depending on market and not pulled out other times, we want to identify that. Um, so that's one component, that's the reporting component. The second component is a periodic material characterization studies or waste characterization studies um, more often. And that is, we have to publish our first uh, one by the beginning of 2024, and then a second one by 27, and then every five years thereafter. Uh, in that study, we will be looking at um, basically uh, quantifying how many recycling programs statewide collect each of these material types. And when I say material types, it'll probably be resin codes, some possible information about the form, uh, which would be clamshells, rigids, um, possibly multi-material packaging and things like that, to the degree that it's possible to sort it um, in a field study is really what we're going after and what information is available from those different programs. That's what we'd be compiling. We would be sending out um, you know, uh, waste characterization sorting teams uh, to solid waste facilities statewide, lar mostly large volume transfer processors, possibly medium volume transfer processors. So predominantly, um, you know, uh, actual solid waste handling facilities that do processing of materials. And at those facilities, we would be looking at what's going into their material recovery lines and what's uh, coming out as residual waste and what is being um, you know, recovered through that process and then actually <clears throat> sold as a commodity um, by those facilities. So in that, <clears throat> we would hope to identify the materials that are coming in of those, which ones have a very low recovery rate. Um, to the degree that we can identify where recovery rates are tied to a form, we would identify that. And we're required to publish that information, um, you know, whenever we do those studies, <clears throat> excuse me, and update that information periodically. That information is then used by both the public or, well, um, the public, manufacturers, um, distributors, and all of those to determine whether or not the actual product that they are producing would meet our standards for recyclability that are laid out in SB 343. If they do not, and absent their ability to meet some of the additional criteria, there's some what we call on ramps where if they can demonstrate absent our information, they can demonstrate that through other uh, recycling programs, buyback programs, things like that, that it is meeting um, an even higher threshold of recyclability uh, or recycling, I think 75% that would be a carve out. So if they can provide alternate information um, that we would not have available to us that demonstrates that it is being recovered and recycled, um, that is another way that they can be compliant with 343. Um, but ultimately they need to use the information that we're providing or information that they are able to collect outside of that to determine whether or not their packaging or products can have the, um, the chasing arrow uh, recycling symbology. Um, so, you know, one slight disconnect is that for 343, we do not have the, or we've been, we have not been directed to publish a um, comprehensive list of all of these products and forms are recyclable. Rather, we're publishing to the best of our ability to gather this information and allowing, um, and, and then the, um, you know, basically the requirement and responsibilities on the manufacturers and distributors to ensure that they're compliant with the requirements. Um, this is a slight diversion from our implementation of uh, SB 1335, where we do 
uh, actually maintain a list. Um, but that's a very different scope since that's just for state-owned facilities. Um, this is much larger. The world is much larger in the different materials and product types that we might have to capture in a list format. Um, Sean, looks like you have a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was curious on the, um, the confusing label exercise that we just did, how some of those um, may have been resolved with Senate Bill 343. Uh, so apologies, I, I uh, didn't, uh, I was answering a few emails while I was getting ready to uh, chat with you folks, so I didn't quite see those. Um, you know, the one critical piece with 343 is Cal Recycle has not been designated as um, being the uh, enforcement authority pursuant to 343. So um, in, in the case of our implementation of 343, we would not be making that determination um, specifically in terms of um, the appropriateness of labeling. That would actually be on our district attorneys and our attorney general to enforce the law itself. And, may, and maybe that's, Mr. Chair, that's somebody, somebody else can help answer that question. I'm just curious, um, you know, I, other than recreating the wheel, I'd like to see or understand how California is dealing with that, or at least as it's a, as you know, we went through that just that exercise and how that may be resolved down there. So I'm just curious based on some of those examples. Yeah, I mean, I, I, oh, go ahead, sorry. And, and maybe someone else on the call is, is better to answer that. I, or, uh, so yeah, I just throw that out there. And it's interesting, you know, so leading up, um, I was chatting with David and, and Alex and I think somebody raised the, um, you know, where you ha might have an OCC package that has a, uh, or a paperboard package that has a plastic component to it. And how do we treat that? And that is something that I'm hoping that we would be able to identify in our material recovery study uh, or the material characterization study, but whether or not that's actually um, ending up being recovered or if it's ending up in the residual stream, because if it's ending up in the residual stream, our results that we would publish would indicate that that packaging may not be suitable for um, having the recycling sim symbols um, advertised on it, uh, as an example. So to the degree that we can identify that um, despite its labeling, it is not being recovered or it's ending up as residual, um, whether it's accepted by recycling programs or not and things like that. That's where we are, you know, our information that we would provide is the basis um, for the decision, not necessarily the confusing labeling, but rather the proof of whether or not it's being recovered. Uh, let's see, I have a few uh, hands up. Uh, Anya, were you next? Yeah. Yeah, unless, Dylan, did you want to jump in? No, okay. Um, yeah, I had a quick question specifically on the timing. Um, you said the first one is due, uh, your first report is due until the um, 2024, before the start of the year. Um, until then, how are producers meeting those compliance standards? So the compliance requirements for 343 uh, actually take effect um, 18 months after okay. either January 1, 2024, or when we publish the report, whichever is later. Uh, okay. So right now, there is no requirement that they need to meet. The packages do not need to be compliant until such time as we've provided information. That makes sense. Thank you. Absolutely. And I, I had a question about something that you did not talk about, but I know as part of 343 is, is you uh, are, are, it's discussed that you'll have Basel compliant markets, that the, the materials have to go to Basel compliant markets. And I understand what Basel is obviously, but I, how, how is that going to be tracked by CalRecycle? Is that, is that a, you know, will you, will you have access to all the end markets of all the MRFs? Is that one of the regulatory changes that's going to occur when you when it's all implemented? That's an excellent question. Um, so for some material types, particularly plastic waste, um, we will have some information in that capacity pursuant to our, actually to our implementation of AB 881, which uh, revolves around the export of um, mixed plastic waste overseas. So while it's, uh, the changes 
to the statute for SB 343 didn't actually give us much uh, opportunity to gather more information in that area, uh, AB 881 actually did. So we will have information on where this material is being exported. It actually will be counted as disposal against jurisdictions pursuant to AB 881. And we'll be publishing information on where those materials are going, as well as, um, you know, in terms of partner countries um, that are receiving those materials, uh, as well as what jurisdictions those materials originated from, specifically in the area of mixed plastics, which really is the area of um, significant concern with respect to Basel uh, Convention. Thank, thank you so much. That was super helpful. Uh, and uh, well, I think Kristen is up next. Thank you. I just am curious on the process, Dan. So um, you do the waste characterization work. You look at what the what's really happening with the materials. Does that information then go back through your recycling commission? And if you talked about how that process works in this, I maybe I missed that. Piece. Oh no, I, I didn't mention the recycling commission. So the recycling commission, um, which actually we support out of um, my team's office as well, um, they are an advisory body. So the uh, recyclable list that they maintain or that they have put together does not carry the weight of law in California. It is it is done as an advisory body. Um, and these are recommendations uh, largely to the legislature because currently CalRecycle does not have the authority from the legislature to define a list of what is recyclable in California and have all the recycling programs basically uh, adhere to that list. That is not within our authority currently. So um, the statewide commission will have access to all of our report information to educate, uh, to inform their recommendations that they provide on a periodic basis, which they're required to publish, you know, an update to their recommendations on a yearly basis. So we would hope that the information that we're um, producing from our material characterization studies and our additional reporting uh, would help inform and further tighten their recommendations for, um, you know, new <coughs> um, opportunities to target some of these more difficult materials. So then their recommendations, and I'm they look through this stuff, but their recommendations go back to the legislature, not back to CalRecycle. Well, they do, they, the recommendations are made um, if it is a recommendation that is within CalRecycle's uh, existing authority to implement, that is something that's, you know, weighed by, um, you know, our director, our executive team, um, Cal EPA, because we are under Cal EPA, and then all, ultimately the governor as well. So I can't say, you know, basically what happens with any given recommendation. Sometimes it's out of our existing authority, and so it really does need to be um, legislated as opposed to um, just implemented by CalRecycle. Thank you. And I guess this was, when you said recycling rate tied to a form, is that like a particular form of a, of a packaging material? Is that what you meant when you were talking about that? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we uh, mentioned that kind of uh, composite packaging type uh, where you might have multiple materials and the fact that there are multiple materials might have actually affect its recyclability. Um, but it's also, you know, just trying to think ahead that if there's a specific form, a specific design of a product that inhibits its recyclability, wow. Um, that's what we're talking about when it comes to forms. Thank you. Absolutely. D Dan, I think you're up next and then Thomas. Yeah, I think you, you mostly answered my first question I had too, so I won't go back to the statewide recycling list or the, the I should say the commissions list. Um, but I am curious too, because it came up in conversation just as I gave an overview of the California law. This, and, and there is a sort of a bifurcation of SB 343. And when you're talking about curbside recycling versus store drop off, I'll, I'll say alternative collection methods. Is Cal Re and as this group's looking at, at that law as well, does Cal Recycle have authority to determine those non-curbside recycling rates, the different threshold that has to be met, or is that not under Cal Recycle's authority to determine if those alternative collections are meeting the, what, 60% recycling rate and then goes up to 75%? Is that under Cal Recycle authority as well? 
So the the authority that we have for the material characterization study, you know, we're allowed to design it. We're allowed to really try and capture as much relevant information as we want. Um, three, the the actual language of the bill does not um, provide a whole lot of uh, specificity about what our study should be. So we're attempting to gather as much relevant information as we can to answer the questions as to whether or not materials would meet the criteria. That said, when it comes to buyback programs or pickups or, or things like that, we have limited opportunities to really mandate any sort of study participation or response. So, you know, there's obviously we're interested in gathering that information to the degree possible. And we'll work with our partners uh, who may have more information than we do, either, um, you know, California's Go Biz or other agencies, other groups within CalRecycle, if they have information that's helpful in us um, providing just as much information to the producers and distributors and so on as possible. We absolutely are interested in doing so. But the, the very, um, I guess, uh, prescriptive focus of SB 343 is on large volume transfer stations and um, really solid waste handlers in the state where we have um, uh, mandatory participation in our study, which means uh, if you're not familiar with our previous work in waste characterization studies, um, we actually have to solicit participation on a voluntary basis from solid waste facilities to go and, and sort the materials and figure out what's actually being disposed or recycled and so on. This is our first um, foray where we've had uh, actual mandated participation, which is very exciting to us um, because recruitment is a huge headache when it comes to performing these studies in the first place. Um, but that, that uh, authority is really tied back to solid waste facilities. So we don't have um, kind of a mandated lever to, to um, compel uh, survey participation from buyback programs and things like that if they're not already regulated by CalRecycle. So again, it's, it's certainly something we're interested in, in partnering with and learning more about and gathering information on. And to the degree that we could include that in our report, we would be very um, willing to do so and, and excited to do so. But it may not um, you know, it may not be a, uh, a focal point of our study. Thanks, Dan. That's helpful as this group looks at whether or not the California approach, the bifurcated approach makes sense for Oregon or not. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And then Thomas, and then I think we need to move to DEQ. And Dan, if we ha need more time with you, if we have more time on the agenda, if you wouldn't mind hanging on through that. Yeah, item, right? I'll, I'll stick it. around. Okay. So Thomas, go ahead, ask your yeah. question. Yeah, thanks, Dan. And I'm trying to maybe correct what I'm hearing or assumptions sound that off of you. So it's essentially the list or the products that Cal Recycle determines a certain percent are recycled in the state means that they can get this exclusive label that has that implies it's recyclable. Is there any, but you're not necessarily maintaining a list of products and types of products that are recyclable. So it's changing kind of every time there's a waste characterization study. And then I'm also trying to think about how does that information then go from the technical report that your team publishes, say, and then down to the local jurisdictions and down to garbage haulers and down to the consumers in general, in terms of, are we relying on the, are you relying on the manufacturers to voluntarily change their labels because they see the report and then those labels are the ones sending that message? Or is there some, is there another way that communication is happening? So, so my understanding of it, and, and again, CalRecycle has not been um, basically authorized to be the enforcement arm for SB 343. My understanding is that it's not local programs that would need to make any changes pursuant to whether or not a material is recyclable, if it's meeting the metrics or not. It's really on the distributor and the manufacturers to ensure that the products they're selling in California um, meet the requirements of SB 343. So that's where... 343 puts the burden is on manufacturers to not be selling materials that are un, uh, that are non-compliant with the law. And so to the, you know, then if it is identified that, you know, these products or packaging um, types are being sold in California, they're not compliant with the law, then it's on, as I said before, the attorney general's office, uh, district attorneys, and so on, um, you know, basically uh, enforcement agencies at various levels to pursue uh, that non-compliance. Super helpful. I, and I, I mean this seriously, I, I, I think we're probably gonna ask that question in two or three more different ways at some point. So D Dan, do you still have your hand raised? No, okay, terrific. And I, I, and I should add, because it did occur to me. So it's, it's not as though that 
that um uh like all of a sudden tomorrow this package i just provided some updated information this package is no longer um compliant um those changes don't need to be made overnight um as i understand the statute um again that 18 month clock is what really it's it's a packaging that's created you know um uh in that 18 months window would would not need to be compliant with whatever the most updated information is so it's it's an 18 month lag effectively from the information we provide and when the that certain material type has to be in compliance incredibly helpful really appreciate it dan i i don't want to run out of time for our oregon list determination uh uh presentation but if you can hang on if we have time there are questions that may be raised absolutely uh, and david i saw your camera come on so i believe you're up I am here. Can you hear me okay, Dylan? Great, yes, thank, thank you very you. much. And thank you, Dan, uh, that was very informative. So this is gonna be kind of a case study in contrasts where the California list, although there is no list, I put air quotes around it, you know, is a determination of which materials producers can put a recyclable symbol or claim on. The Oregon list actually will be a list. It'll be two lists or multiple lists and these lists will impose requirements on local governments and producer responsibility organizations, independent of labeling requirements. So here's how it will work. There's gonna be a rulemaking that's gonna start up uh, very soon and conclude in 2023. And that rulemaking will identify two major lists. The first is a list of materials that are suitable for local governments to collect under the opportunity to recycle. That's our statute, foundational statute that goes back to 1983. And then there's a second list of what producer responsibility organizations will be responsible to provide collection and recycling of. The local government opportunity to recycle applies to, to both on-route collection and drop-off collection. Um, and locals have some flexibility to choose between you know, which, which mode or modes they use. The PRO collections are specifically around drop-off collection or the potential for mobile collection events. And then there's just one other important distinction here as we sort of show the whole family tree of these materials. On route collection by local governments um, has sort of two sub lists. The first list is called the Uniform Statewide Collection List. And this is the list of commingled collection. And it is the only part of section 22 of the act that actually has a prohibition in it. And the prohibition says, if you, it's both a mandate and a prohibition. It says if, if the local government chooses to implement the opportunity to recycle by using commingled collection, then whatever they collect via commingled collection must comport with the uniform statewide collection list. Everything that's on the uniform statewide collection list must be collected in their commingled program and nothing else may be accepted in their commingled collection program. So this is basically a guarantee to the commingled processors that they're gonna get the same mix of the same materials from every community around the state. Um, but there are some additional materials that may be required of local governments under the OTR that are not on the uniform statewide collection list. For example, motor oil or glass. Uh, if we don't want those materials in the commingled list, but still want to require local governments to collect them, then they could be required through this uh, approach. So just as a practical matter, um, we're expecting that there's gonna be, continue to be some diversity in programming between different local governments. Some are gonna collect materials via drop-off, some are materials gonna collect materials via on-route collection, some will do both. Some are only gonna collect the materials required by the rule. And we anticipate that some local governments are gonna go above and beyond the rule, which they can do so long as they don't add it to the commingled system. So the Recycling Modernization Act does not prohibit Marion County from continuing to collect batteries uh, on route, so long as they are not put in the commingled bin. Now, this rulemaking uh, that should uh, come before the commission in 2023 is not the end of the process. Um, the PROs through their program plans can also propose changes. They can propose adding materials to the uniform statewide collection list. This is the proverbial Oregon on ramp. Um, and if DEQ, after consultation with ORSAC and the public, um, approves um, that, then it can be added to the Uniform Survey collect Collection List. And then PROs may do some other recycling as well. For example, there's a plastic packaging recycling goal in the act, which um, we don't believe that the statewide lists by themselves will meet. They'll make significant progress towards those goals, but the PROs are gonna have to take some additional steps 
probably to meet those plastics recycling goals. And we'll have to offer some additional collections. And then above and beyond what the PRO is doing, let's not ignore the fact that the Recycling Modernization Act allows private recyclers to do what they do. Um, so there will be still other recycling going on, you know, I don't know, wine cork recycling or scrap metal recycling and other recycling as well. And then um, also that initial rulemaking is just the first one. The EQC can always revisit these lists through subsequent rulemakings and subsequent years. So that's sort of the, how, you know, to the, this idea that there will be lists. Yes, there will be lists and some of them will be established in rule and some of them will not. So in terms of how and when the rulemaking happens, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, we're um, forecasting that proposed rules, this first set will be considered by the Environmental Quality Commission around September of 2023. And there's a few major steps to get to that. Um, first is a research phase. Um, Section 22 sub three of the Recycling Modernization Act requires the commission to consider a very long list of evaluation criteria. Um, or, or, sorry, to consider materials against that long list of evaluation criteria. And DEQ has started that research <clears throat> on behalf of the commission. Um, we are working to bring in some, some contracted uh, resources to help with some of that evaluation. Um, we have also just recently published a request for information that was broadcast widely, uh, inviting producers and producer organizations and others to share information about how their materials um, comport or not with the statutory criteria. And then we're also convening a technical work group, which we hope will have its first meeting next month that will help to review all that material. And then as we wind down the research and evaluation phase, we'll go into rulemaking uh, proper. I will mention that the act requires substantive rulemaking on around eight different topics. We are not gonna do eight different rulemakings. We're proposing to do two. So each rulemaking is gonna bundle a number of topics. Um, this particular scope, uh, section 22, will be in what we call rulemaking number one, which is the first up, um, along with several other topics. The rulemaking advisory committee will probably start meeting around July, but we'll start up with some of the other topics in their scope. Uh, we're expecting that the materials lists topic will get in front of this rulemaking advisory committee in the fall after the technical work group has wrapped up and DEQ has able to prepare a draft uh, rules concept for the rulemaking advisory committee to consider. Then we go through the whole standard rulemaking process, RAC weighs in, there's a fiscal impact assessment, DEQ drafts rules, there's a public comment period, we respond to those public comments, potentially the rules are revised and then they get before the EQC again in September. And then one last step here, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the Oregon Recycling System Advisory Council will also have an opportunity to weigh in and make recommendations on this topic. We don't know the exact timing. I'm just saying somewhere in the middle of this process because that committee has not um, stood up and, and set its schedule for the year yet. So just for purposes of this task force here, a couple of key takeaways I would share with you. The first is that DEQ will not be able to tell you during the duration of this task force which materials will definitely be on which list. That decision is one for the EQC to make and that decision will come in September of next year. But I do think it is safe to assume that the lists will likely change over time or there's, a, there's a definitely several ways in which those lists could change and that collection modes will change over time as well. For example, some materials might start out being collected exclusively via drop-off, and then over time might migrate their way into on-route collection and the uniform statewide collection list. So that's a possibility. Um, I will hazard a couple of other predictions based on a preliminary review of materials and the statutory criteria in section 22 sub three. And mind you, these are just my predictions and not you know, any formal designation by the agency. Um, my first prediction is that I think there's going to be pretty good overlap um, between the materials that make it onto one, either of Oregon's lists and what California allows to be labeled as recyclable. Uh, for example, paperboard packaging, cardboard boxes, aluminum and steel cans, PET and HDP bottles. All the preliminary indications at least are that those will meet California's criteria. And these are materials that so far in our conversations, no one is objecting to including in the recycling list in Oregon. The other prediction I'll make is that um, 
I'm anticipating there's going to be pretty good overlap between what is not on the interstate's lists. Uh, materials that California prohibits from being labeled as recyclable, many of those materials will likely not be um, on Oregon's uh, lists. Not all of them. There may be some differences, and, and I think you'll explore that in a few minutes. But as an example, um, uh, PVC packaging is likely not going to be allowed to be labeled as recyclable under California. It's very difficult to imagine how that material could meet the statutory criteria under 343. And I don't know, it might end up on one of Oregon's lists, but um, right now, no one has, that. there's no market and uh, we're not aware of a market and the processors are not prepared to separate it out. So that would be, that'd be quite a stretch just as an example. Um, so I'll stop there and see if there's any questions around the Oregon list process. Anya? Yeah, I was wondering if you could share the criteria um, either now or I, you said it's a long list. So maybe after the fact um, that um, this rulemaking will be based on. Yes, absolutely. I'll just point out the criteria are all spelled out in section 22 sub 3 of the act. Mm -hmm. And we will follow up either chat or email with the full list of criteria. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? David, my question is a reflection, a quest, a request for reflection upon hearing that and following uh, Dan's presentation. You know, what what are you know you drew some connections already, but what are some other connections that you can draw between those those two efforts? And again, it's. It's such an interesting dichotomy. One is is a determination of recyclability. The other is a you know is a labeling consideration. I think it's a really interesting. I'd like to hear what you think about the interplay there. Well, it is fascinating, really, because you know the the, the two states have each picked up half of the question, the the opposite halves, right? Um, and that's where we currently stand. And I know there's a there's a there's an effort underway to bring greater uniformity to lists in California. And we, we've got a labeling task force that's meeting right now talking about the possibility of some labeling, labeling regulations for Oregon. But at present, um, I do think there's very important overlap. Um, it is difficult to imagine very many items that are sold in Oregon that are not sold into California. So pretty much anything on the shelf of a, a grocery store in Oregon, with few exceptions, is also going to be sold in the same packaging with the same labels into California. And I believe what that means is that um, Oregon is going to ride the coattails of Senate Bill 343. Um, there are some times um, in which California passes regulations that um, disrupt or have the potential of disrupting systems in Oregon. I think 343 is a, is a nice example of where California is gonna help Oregon out. Um, because if indeed our rules-based list of what is recyclable in Oregon has fairly good overlap with what's allowed to be recyclable, labeled as recyclable in California. And more importantly, if most of the items that are not on our list, that is that we would define to be contamination, if most of the items that are, on our, that are not on our lists are prohibited from having a recycling label by the state of California, then that's going to reduce contamination and confusion in the state. I'll point out, labels are not the only source of contamination. Um, <clears throat> hypodermics and diapers and garden hoses do not have recycling symbols on them, but they show up at our MRFs anyways. So labeling by itself does not solve the problem of contamination, but it has potential to reduce it. And I think the 343 implementation of 343 will be largely a very good thing for the recycling system in Oregon. Um, I would just finally close by repeating that this situation is going to remain dynamic. Um, California's lists may change, Oregon's lists may change. There's always going to be the potential for lack of perfect alignment between them. But generally speaking, I think the alignment will for the most part be there. Incredibly helpful, David. Sean, go ahead. No, thanks, David. Appreciate that. And um, I guess to my question earlier, I guess you won't really be able to answer that for a while then on 
how California will solve some of the confusing label issues that we just addressed in the beginning of the meeting? Or, or do you have any insight on that? No, I think we could go back through those examples and the examples that task force members brought forward and we could go back through that and we could speculate, that's all we can do. Yeah. We could speculate about some likely or some potential outcomes. And I think given some of those examples um, that, that some of those labels that, that task force members or Alex shared will be prohibited by California. Um, is, is that something that would be useful for the next meeting? Just so I, I mean, I, I, I like the exercise. I just kind of want to understand now the outcome. <laughs> we'll be guessing at it. Yeah. I, I wanted to underline that, that we both Dan and David won't be able to say what will come, but you know, we, we would, we could speculate on, on what that will mean, because again, they have to go through the process to make that determination and that can't be short circuited, obviously. Yeah. Understood. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, but here's here's an example. Um, well, actually, this might not be. Well, let's just use that Sharps container. Um, you know, and Dan, Dan, you didn't see the Sharps container, but it was a you know a, a wall-mounted Sharps container in a medical clinic with a recycling symbol on it. Um, I don't know what the plastic, what resin it was, um, and I don't know if three forty three addresses it, but it would be interesting to go back into your statute and see if that container could have a recycling symbol on it in the future. Um, we had a couple of really kind of really, really easy examples that we didn't share in the interest of time that we might bring forward as well that I think will make clear uh, a number of currently labeled packages and products that will not have the recycling symbol in the future because of 343. So we can revisit that, the chair one system. Yeah, thank you. Thomas, go ahead. And I, I we're at, at time. So I'm going to ask David and Dan to hang on through this next conversation because I think questions will come back up. But last question, Thomas. Yeah, thanks. And I don't know if the, I guess this is maybe a question for Dan Moore. Um, the, is what SB 343 is regulating is the chasing arrow symbol itself. So is that the the symbol that we're, we're identifying as the misleading label or is it is it other things on the package as well? Well, it's, it's effectively recyclability claims on a packaging. So um, <clears throat> labeling that would direct people to assume or believe that that package or product um, is recyclable in the state of California. And, and Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, but but the chasing arrows is 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 called out in statute as a recyclability claim. It is. So, yes. so it's, it is larger than that, Thomas. Okay, um, so I, I, I know there could be further conversation. I, I know that I could take Dan myself for three hours and ask him questions. And David, that was incredibly helpful. I'm going to be watching this recording myself, so thank you. Um, but I, I did wanna do a bit of an exercise that, that is inspired by the differences between these pieces and, and what our focus as a task force will be moving forward. So Alex, would you mind going to the, the next slide? Um, and could you actually just have the whole slide up? I, I, the animation doesn't doesn't help me. Thank you so much. So um, I, I I wanted to you know kind of highlight. Obviously, this is you know 343 and 582 are going to have significant impact on recyclability, uh, recyclability claims, uh, labeling in general, uh, and obviously you know there's an interplay between the two of them. So that's super clear. So I thought it would be helpful to run through an exercise using this diagram and use a bit of the time until the quarter hour. So we have a little bit more than 15 minutes uh, to talk about what we're seeking to solve with this process. So this is very clear that this is a theoretical accepted materials list. So the determination has not been made yet. We've not gone through there of both Oregon and our neighbor to the South. Um, so just again, discussion purposes only. So the list in the middle is that list that David was talking about of potential accepted materials list that would be shared by both states. So Oregon is part of the RMA implementation, California is part of SB 343 and, and determination, obviously not making a list, but uh, if you can uh, bear with me. Obviously these are common accepted materials, PT bottles, 
HDP containers, metal containers, uh, office paper, glass, newspaper. These materials will have no problem being labeled in recyclable in either state. So depending on how implementation happens that, you know, obviously there could be some specifics or some grace notes of those things like with a, a shrink sleeve label or something like that. But under the scenario of the items on this list, again, all things being equal, would be able to be labeled as recyclable. So they would not be an issue for either labeling in California or, or the Oregon recycling system. So I, I thought it would be helpful to look at the, or we thought it would be helpful to look at the margins. So on the left, we have PET thermoforms. So under this scenario, again, this theoretical scenario, um, they may pass the California system. So would be able to be labeled as recyclable in California. But again, under this scenario, let's say that they are unable to be on Oregon's statewide list, right? Then on the right, you have polypropylene. So that, again, under this theoretical scenario is on Oregon statewide list. But again, under this scenario outlined in SB 343, it would not be able to be labeled with any recyclability claims in California. So what will happen if both of these scenarios come true? You know, what will the outcome be if PET thermoforms are labeled as recyclable in California, but not on Oregon statewide list? And then what would be the outcome if polypropylene is not able to be labeled as recyclable, but is on Oregon's list? And so I wanted to have a bit of a conversation with task force members as to, you know, you know, to kind of game that out. You know, what happens if it's labeled as recyclable, but comes, comes in here under this future state where SB 582 is implemented? Um, and maybe we can start with, let's maybe let's start with the, the left side. So labeled in California, but not on accepted materials list in Oregon. We would love, love folks commentary. You could raise your hand. Go ahead, Thomas. I would, I think my initial reaction is that it's kind of the status quo. Things are, all types of things are labeled recyclable and they're not. On the other side of it, it would remove the ability for <clears throat> education and outreach to rely on the recycling label as a tool to communicate with customers about what our consumers about what is on the list. Right. So would, you couldn't say, hey, go to this label because the label may be inaccurate. And, and at, at the same time, something that popped in mind when we were thinking about this. So, A, you would... Uh, be able to maybe educate about that using the anti-contamination education protocol that's going to come out in 582. And conversely, it's an opportunity for producers of PET thermoforms. If, if they are not on the list, why are they not on Oregon's list? And then maybe able to do those activities that would enable them, you know, whether that's investment in the, you know, the sortation facilities or whether that is, you know, uh, increasing demand of, of thermoform only bales or whatever that might be, you know, th those are some other pieces that kind of came to my mind. Are there other thoughts from folks? Oh, I really, oh, there we go, Kristen. I was like, gosh, I really thought people would have something to say about this. Go ahead, Kristen. Well, I'm just curious if the labeling considered in California, um, or any other place really is kind of as it is currently on so many packages, which is state specific. Like if you look at our bottle bills, right? We have, you know, it's here's your 10 cents back in these states and whatever it might be. Um, it, is that one way to solve the problem or are you not contemplating that in this discussion, Dylan, that the potential is that it's state specific um, language to match what the state is doing as it currently is on bottle bill, for example. Well, we're discussing what it might be. So that that could be a that could be an outcome from this. So that that would be one way to implement is to to label that. Dan, I guess I have a question for you. Maybe this is uh, connected to to that. Is under three forty three? Could you have a recyclable in California or recyclable in Oregon, but not in California? Like a state specific, you know, like a bottle, like a DRS or a bottle bill type type law. So you know. Um, let's say a, so now we're on this side, on the polypropylene side, so sorry, I'm, I'm pointing it out like you can see my point. Uh, on the polypropylene side, it would say recyclable in Oregon. Would that be in, in, in a, um, you know, in conflict with, with uh, 343? 
You know, that's an interesting one. I haven't, uh, haven't gamed that scenario through with our um, legal office, but, but from me personally, just my interpretation, I would think that that would not be misleading labeling because it is clearly specifying that, you know, it is recyclable um, in a certain location. So it's not um, misleading, um, you know, a consumer to believe that it's recyclable in California, but that's just my, uh, you know, from the hip thoughts on it, um, you know, to, to get something a little bit more um, substantial, I'd, I'd have to loop back. But to me, you know, it, it passes that, that kind of basic sanity check. Um, and since this would, you know, have to go to a court you know, effectively, I think that would be a challenging one to pursue um, be, as as misleading uh, recyclability claims. Very helpful. Thank you, Dan. Anya, go ahead. Yeah, I just think uh, one thing that I keep coming back to is that these lists and new recyclability claims are not going to be made in a vacuum, um, obviously from either state, but also just from our past history, um, and that there is going to be a, a need for re-education and retraining, which I know um, 582 will address, um, but also just thinking about how we um, communicate that effectively through our labeling, um, needing to make sure that, you know, say something is no longer accepted in Oregon, used to be accepted in some places or is accepted in California, like how we can clearly and concisely communicate that as a a difference or a change in behavior. And I think sometimes just absence of information is not actually information. Um, so really thinking about how we clarify those labels. So it's recycling, not recycling. That's, that's a helpful thought, Anya. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna call on David now. You're not on camera. So I hope that I'm pausing briefly to see if you're at your you are. Hey, David. <laughs> Excellent. Um, could you could you reflect on that as 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 a question, David? Uh, did you hear what Anya had had requested? Is is there anything in in five eighty two in the RMA that that is is launching a kind of recyclability training as opposed to just the just the um, the anti contamination programming suite that's that is required to be offered to community to residents and by communities. Right. Well, there is. I mean, the anti-contamination programming is probably the most significant element in terms of the dollar commitment. But section 14, well, let me step back a minute. Um, the Opportunity to Recycle Act, going back to 1983 and then amended in 1991, already requires local governments to provide significant information and feedback, you know, and, and you know, to both household and business generators. And that requirement hasn't gone away. So there will still be that um, mechanism. There will be this new contamination reduction programming requirement. And then also under section 14 of the Oregon Act, the um, PROs are required to develop educational resources and promotional campaigns to promote the uniform statewide collection list. Now, let me just read a few details here. Resources and campaigns must include, but need not be limited to, a description of materials identified for recycling, requirements to properly prepare materials for recycling, and education on the importance of not placing contaminants in commingled recycling collection. So if, for example, shredded paper, which is currently accepted for recycling in some parts of the state, but on others, are no longer, is no longer on the, or is not on the uniform statewide collection list, then it is by definition a contaminant and the PRO has an obligation to say something about it in these educational materials they develop. And then they're required to do an annual, they're required to provide educational materials in multiple languages that are responsive to the needs of uh, uh, diverse audiences across the state that local governments can use. And then they are also required to run at least one statewide campaign uh, involves outreach and promotion per year. And, and reflecting on that further, it is, you know, it behooves the PRO to make sure that they're hitting these lists to be able to have that type of kind of splashy communication at the outset, as well as, again, reflecting on it that the ORSAC will, you know, provide recommendations and may say that that is something we want to be part of that program plan, for instance, that would be um, submitted by the PRO eventually. Thank you, Dylan. And I would just add, it behooves the PRO in part because Separately, the PRO is obligated to pay to every commingled recycling facility what's called a contamination management fee, which is a 
fixed per ton amount multiplied by the tonnage of covered products that the that are contaminants that the MRFs remove. Um, so the more confused the public is, uh, the more contamination the public is putting in their bin, the more the PROs will have to pay. The less contamination the public is putting in their bins, the less the PROs will have to pay. Thank, thank you, David. I, again, a very robust answer. I, I, I would like David and Dan to be on all calls moving forward. Thank you so much. Appreciate your support. Um, okay. Are there other other questions or commentary? And maybe I'll I'll expand it a little bit. We're talking about you know these this impact of California and and Oregon, but also we have the backdrop which is purple. We have the 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 purple list of materials, which is you know these are outside of accepted materials lists or potentially. So we look at PVC or multilayer films or or polystyrene or coffee pods. You know that that may or may not be on lists. You know, again, we can speculate, but you know, I, I I'd love I'd love commentary as to again, not just generally speaking, but rather what the impact will be if it it you know, given this scenario of what this accepted materials list like, what would the impact be on on us in Oregon as Oregon residents? Go ahead, Dave. Well, maybe I don't understand the question, but um, I think the problem we have now is these items are labeled as recyclable. People think they are recyclable and they may or may not be. And so the, the idea of putting them on the list, let's assume that they are for the moment not going to make the list then I don't think anything changes. They were contaminants before, they're contaminants now, and they'd be required to e either drop their current labeling or add a not recyclable label. Do I have that correct? Well, not the not recyclable, but just drop their current labeling. So, so let's let's use PVC as an example because David brought it up earlier. And again, sorry, this is this is a theoretical future state when 343 is implemented and 582 is there. Is essentially what is the problem that the Truth and Labeling Task Force is trying to solve for that future state? So, in this future state, let's say that the PVC is is uh it would be outside of this meaning that it is not labeled in california and it's not accepted in oregon so what is the challenge that we would and of course there's anti-contamination pieces so what do we what is the problem we're trying to solve with pvc is the, is the question I, I i think i'm i'm sorry hopefully that's a little bit clearer and dan go ahead me dan Yes, I'm sorry, Dan Felton. Yes, <laughs> with the hand everyone. raised. Yeah, thank you. And I pr really appreciate this question because there's a little bit of a different dynamic here in Oregon that we're talking about sort of within, well, we are talking within the context of uh, the EPR program. And from industry's perspective, and I'll use multi-layer films as an example, is we understand that uh, within this context of does it or does it not make a list is we still want to have the opportunity to make the list. And David alluded to that earlier, is there's a, if there's a way to get to the list, but to put the further challenge in terms of recyclability labeling to, to somehow not allow uh, a packaging to be labeled or to help consumers to understand how they can recycle, it becomes a problem when we're trying to create markets for some of this material. I just put it that way. So I think there's a challenge, um, a little bit different in California. And I know we're talking in Oregon because California doesn't have EPR within this context yet. Um, but as well as Oregon is interested in end market development and trying to find paths forward for things which maybe aren't as well recycled today, but industry would like them to be recycled. So it's a challenge. I get it. <laughs> um, you know, but um, if it's on ramps, if it's a way to get there without a just a thumbs up or thumbs down that you can, you know, it, it's it's labeled right or not labeled right. Thank you, Dan. And and again, that that sort of does talk about that that uh, that binary situation that Anya was was talking about as an idealized place is that you know you do have that determination 
that would let you say what that is. And then if you do do that investment and make, uh, make oh, I always, I like using my my anonymous prop. You do make this Giga recyclable, uh, which is a, some recovered aluminum that, that, you know, you would be able to be put on the list and you would have to go through that process. And both it, both, of the Oregon bill and the California bill do allow for that re recheck in as well. So, uh, and, and uh, adjustments on that. Sorry, Dylan, could you repeat the, your example that you showed us? It's a, it's a what now? Sorry, this is a giga. I was just using it as a prop. It doesn't actually mean anything. I was, I was oh. trying to do it to make it, uh, uh, an anonymous piece. So this is a cone of recovered aluminum. Um, it is not on my current accepted materials list, but let's say that the pr producers of this Giga want it to be recyclable. They could do the investments and interact with that and prove out end markets, et cetera, uh, and then eventually get on those lists because of those on-ramps that are provided through both 343 and 582. Thank you. Okay. So we are at our public comment period, and it appears that we have three folks that are signed up, and I'm going to scroll up and see who they are in order. And the first is Walter Reeder from the EPS Industry Alliance. Walter, do you want to come off on mute, and you can uh, ask your question. Okay, I think I'm there. Thank you, Dylan, and the rest of the panel. Uh, enjoyed it as always. Uh, the one thing that I thought was, uh, so we're expanded polystyrene. We are not been recyclable. Um, our recycling all goes through drop-offs and special efforts and take backs and things like that. Uh, so this effort is actually extremely uh, encouraging and refreshing because we are frequently interacting with competing materials who are making outrageous and unsupported and um, inaccurate uh, recyclability claims. And, but the one thing that I thought was interesting is we went through the examples at the beginning, uh, it was the wine box with the environmentally friendly or preferable or whatever, clearly not in compliance with the existing green guides. Um, that has been my direction to my people always is to comply with the green guides. And I was hoping that the panel um, could tell me why there was no one pointed out that so many of those uh, claims were um, not consistent with uh, current green guides and presumably other consumer protection uh, state level um, um, uh, methods that are in existence. So, so the, quest, the question to the, the panel is, is why those were chosen? The, those pictures were chosen? They, they were chosen just oh. to sort of jump. Oh, I'm sorry. No, sorry. Uh, my question is, why didn't anyone point out that so many of those claims were in violation of the um, of the green guides? I, because that's we weren't discussing the green guides, I guess, is the, okay. the answer is we were we were discussing just again, broad. That's it was a, meant to be a personalized version of, of what this would be. But that's a, 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 a key reflection, Walter. I appreciate you bringing that up. OK, thank you. Uh, appreciate it. I think you, also, um, Dylan, we've asked for more information as appropriate from the DEQ about the FTC Green Guides process and the uh, potential changes that are supposed to be coming through that process over the next year or so. So I imagine as there's more conversation about FTC Green Guides, you'll probably see more conversation about that here. And if I recall correctly, Kristen, you asked um, if there's any record of any enforcement. It's either you or it's Mr. Kramer at the last meeting. Yes, and, and actually the, that request for information is outgoing and we are hoping to be able to have more examples in future meetings. So that's uh, glad you brought that up, Kristen. Walter, thank you for the question. Moving on to our next questioner, and, and I'm sorry, I meant to mention that we have a two minute limit for folks. So it's uh, the esteemed Jerry Powell. Jerry, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and make your comment? Yeah, uh, thank you. I uh, do wanna uh, compliment all of you for uh, dedicating your time and effort to this. It's very important. I have one point though. We have a situation where we actually have widely recycled materials in the United States, accepted in the majority of programs, and they're not collected in Oregon. And I would give an example of a yogurt, um, a cottage cheese tub lid, or a bottle cap. Widely, uh, by all definitions, in terms of technology, market, uh, and everything else, 
So Dylan discussed earlier uh, the recycling system of the future that will be coming from the whole uh, emergence and evolution of the SB 582 process. I, I urge you to look forward. Uh, Dylan, on your chart, you have polypropylene widely accepted, uh, PET thermoforms accepted in San Francisco and everything else. Let's make sure we're looking at the modern MRF, the upgraded modern MRF, and not necessarily uh, uh, of, of some of the older uh, facilities in Oregon. Uh, something in the future could be recyclable in Oregon that's not now just because of sorting technology. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And it's a, a, a really appreciate that comment. And also to uh, remind me that the, to tell everybody that this is a theoretical list. This is not a reflection of actual lists. And and yes, our hope would be that 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 data that that uh, that will determine recyclability, as David pointed out, will be a robust one. So thank thank you for that comment, Jerry. And then I have another comment, Maya uh, Maya Bulow from Blaine County. Hi there. Can you all hear me and see me okay? Yes. Great. Hi, thank you guys for taking my question. That was a great segue to what I wanted to ask. Um, something that was coming up for me, there were several comments around um, consumers either being misled by the recycling label or um, not reading at all, that so few people actually reference the label. And something that I think was in some of the supplemental material provided um, had mentioned, um, you know, using future technologies like QR coding or resin scanning or other, other kinds of um, IDs that might not be as widespread right now, but could be part of, and maybe in other states, part of um, future technological solutions for sorting and maybe taking the onerous of decision-making off of consumers. And so this is also kind of a question to Will about um, how, much, how much of an impact these kinds of things have made on contamination in MRFs. Um, so how, you know, how strong of an influence does, does really solid labeling have and is maybe another direction of, of serious consideration to be removing labeling altogether and using technology to solve that issue or, or instruction that isn't on the product itself um, that may be easier to, to change as you go. So that's just a question of whether or not maybe that's that's something to seriously consider. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. A very thoughtful question. I, I, I want to chew on, I think, and also to chew on. Oh, sorry, Will, you wanted to comment? Uh, I, I can try. I, I appreciate those thoughts. Um, I would um, I would say that that's a, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would say that that labeling that is not misleading somehow, if we could get to it, would help in lowering the contamination rates. Um, of course, you can't tell that until it happens. You know, we we've we as in um, the haulers in our area, the uh, our county, our state, the processors, including my company have done a lot of education to the public um, and that is also part of it. Um, have we seen a true lowering of the contamination in the MRF? Um, I don't think so. I think it's still between 15 and 22 percent depending on the truck and the day and, and what's in there. Um, not labeling at all I, I think would be uh, trouble. I, I when you talk about technology, I think the QR code is interesting. I, 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 a lot of people have cell phones now, not, not everybody. Um, the technology in the form of updated equipment to be able to pull the yogurt cups, as Jerry said, and some of the other stuff um, uh, would be awesome. You know, we're talking about, I would guess, two or $3 million uh, to get up to speed uh, just in a wide, wide guess, just for our MRF alone. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hope in there. Um, and I, and I hope that we get down the road 
that we can get to a point where it's not going to be perfect for everybody, but get to a point where we can find that that meeting point between um, understandability is that a word um, by the people and um, you know and an understanding at, at, at the company level. You know, I think education is key in educating the young adults and children so that it becomes part of their lives is key as well. I could go on, but uh, I appreciate those comments. Thank you. I don't know if I answered. I think you answered. I, I, I could also just say short, we don't, we don't have a great deal of, uh, of actual data to, you know, say, say, say what, le, what impact labeling is. We do know that that labeling can be confusing, but whether or not that results in act, actions, there's just a lot of inference, but that's something that we need more information about. Um, so super great question and, 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 and great answer. Thank you, Will. Okay, so we are at our uh, closing of our, our uh, public comment. There was a long written comment that was added to the chat that will be added to the, the uh, written comment period that will be shared out um, following, you know, as part of the Truth and Labeling Task Force uh, resources page on the DEQ website. Uh, so that will be available to all. Um, I, I would suggest that this may be, that th this, this diagram may be something we revisit um, uh, with the next meeting to be able to dig in on, again, to sort of see what that future state would be. And again, trying to focus on what our charge is and what is our charge. Our charge, of course, is that the task force shall study and evaluate misleading or confusing claims regarding the recyclability of products made on a product product packaging. The study must include consideration of issues affecting accessibility for diverse audiences. It must be done no later than June 1, 2022. So, um, so with that, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about our next steps and a little bit of homework that will be tasked to the, um, uh, to the task force members. You should have received shortly before this meeting launched, uh, Alex sent out two calendar invites, again, reflecting the times that we are going to be most available to, um, uh, 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 most available that responded to the doodle polls. So we have a handful of pieces of homework here. We have uh, a follow-up info uh, from the questions that came up in meeting number one that will be coming out from Alex. We are going to ask you all to review the menu of options that are shared in that first meeting. So uh, again, it's that first meeting. It was one of the links that came in the original the, the original pieces. There are a number of options, and some of us have thought about other options. You know, we can maybe think of this as a uh, as Lego pieces that are put together. This is a totally original thought that I just came up with. Nobody's ever used this in this context. I'm glad I got you, Kristen. Uh, so Lego pieces and an optional for this next meeting is to take those Lego pieces and maybe pull apart those options and maybe bring a strong person labeling, straw person labeling proposal for the next meeting. So you can look at that menu of options. That's your homework to make sure that we have all reviewed them. And then maybe there's a bits and pieces of, of one or another of those labeling proposals that you would like to pull out and bring to that next group. So those are the, the, the homework that we'll do. We'll obviously share the agenda out in advance with the task force members. And again, you should have those calendar invites out in your inbox as we speak. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so the Legos are all David. For those who did not get my very heavy handed humor, this is uh, from the Oregon Recycling Steering Committee alumni. Uh, we, we all use Legos very often. They're, they're from uh, the, the DEQ folks. So thank you, thank you for that metaphor. Um, or analogy rather. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm gonna look to Alex to see if I've missed anything from the, the closing up shop and, and homework and pieces like that. Alex, did I miss anything? No, I think you have it there. I would like to remind folks that you do have to register for the upcoming meetings. And for those who are listening in, that information will be posted on the Truth in Labeling website, uh, hopefully this week as well as the recordings for this website will be up there uh, as soon as we get those transcripts and, and everything uh, taken care of. Thank you so much. And Kristen, go ahead real quick. Just a question. So you bring a straw person labeling proposal in the next meeting yes. or send one to you ahead of time if we can put one together that makes more sense. I mean, I, 
if you if you have time to send it to you, we didn't want to have a cutoff point because the meetings are so close to each other. So if you can, that would be terrific. Uh, it'll like more likelihood that we'll all digest it if you send it to all of the task force members. Yeah, absolutely, sure. Okay, thank you. And with that, I want to thank our speakers. I want to thank DEQ. I want to thank Alex uh, for putting this together and thank all of uh, the task force members for giving the time and all of you that have hung in there because some of you are on the East Coast. Thank you, Dan and others. Thank you for hanging in there. We really appreciate all the time and effort and we look forward to our next meeting. Thank you all so very much. And Dylan, I would just like to give a special thanks to Dan Brown from uh, Cal Recycles yes. who uh, jumped on this call kind of last minute for us and, and provided that information. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And and we'll we need you at all the other meetings. We'll call you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Alex, did you uh, say the the date and time of the next meeting? I must have missed it. Uh, you should have two calendar invites uh, in your oh, inbox okay. for those. Uh, I'm on a different screen, so okay. I, don't, I don't have that. I'll look there. Thank you. Yeah, if you don't see them, uh, let me know. We'll also be sending out uh, a gov delivery with the, that information as well. Uh, Great. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks. Bye-bye.